Hello and welcome to Padres Corner. This is the show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane. On the other side, I am Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, and uh, I'm here in my partially built-out studio in the Vatican. Y- yeah, yeah, it really is in the Vatican. In fact, I'm just a couple of feet away from St. Peter's. If if I could stare out this window, I'd be staring straight at the dome. But that's neither here nor there because we're here for the tech. That's right. We're all geeks. We're all nerds. We're all people who like science and technology. We get jazzed by seeing humankind advance. And you know what? I really can think of no better way that we can start the day than to poop. (laughs) That's right. Specifically, we want to take a look at your gut bacteria. Now, you probably didn't know this, or actually some of you probably did, but the bacteria that you have in your body is usually a good thing. And antibiotics are usually not your friend. Now, we've been trained to think of bacteria and microorganisms as bad things. They make us sick. They give us infections. And otherwise, they're undesirable to have in or near our bodies. And yet, we've known for decades that we can't live without those microorganisms in our gut. That microbiome is actually a complex community. We're talking about trillions upon trillions, hundreds of trillions of microorganisms that are in a mutually beneficial relationship within our gut. In fact, if you were to remove all microorganisms from our body, it would basically make life impossible. Now, they live by fermenting undigested carbohydrates, and in turn, they do things like synthesize vitamin B and K, and they metabolize certain compounds for us that become easier for us to digest, easier for us to break down. In other words, you remove those bacteria and we die. Now, here's here's a mind-blowing stat. There are more beneficial microorganisms living inside of our bodies right now some of us have more microorganisms than others, then there are cells in the human body. And for the most part, they keep us healthy. So what happens when those microorganisms suddenly die? And you don't really have to get too creative to think of ways in which that could happen because we kill them all the time when we take antibiotics. Now, broad-spectrum antibiotics were considered sort of a miracle drug. They were something that we used for pretty much everything, every infection, every health issue. Every time we had to go to the doctor, go to the hospital, we kind of wanted a pill. We wanted something that we could pop and it would fix everything. Unfortunately, it's turning out that that's causing more trouble than it's worth. The American Society for Microbiology, they did a study on how antibiotics affect the microbiomes that I just described. And the results were, well, a gut punch to those who overindulge in antibiotics. A single course of broad-spectrum oral antibiotics knocked the microbiome completely out of balance for months, if not up to a year. One of the worst effects that they saw was the destruction of microbes that produce bibuterate, I think it's what I call it. It's a short-chain fatty acid that helps the body fight off inflammation and cancerous cell development. In other words, the bacteria that helped us to avoid cancer and to break down those fatty acids that we need, they were just wiped out. In other words, antibiotics can actually help with infection, but they should be used sparingly because they then destroy our body's ability to continue living. Now, of course, sometimes we need antibiotics. And often the people taking antibiotics are exactly the people who can't be suffering the ill effects of taking antibiotics. In other words, if you are ill enough to need antibiotics, if you are one of the people who would benefit from taking antibiotics, then it's also possible that the removal of that healthy biome will cause some serious health issues that, uh, well, you can't afford. Now, what do we do? How do we get through? How do we maintain our biome? How do we take the drugs that could save our lives? How do we take the antibiotics that could stop an infection? How do we take the pharmacology that will help us with modern life if it could also destroy what we need? Well, maybe we could use them sparingly. Maybe we could try some home remedies. Maybe we could even try toughing it out. Of course, there is another option. We could eat poop. No, I'm not kidding. This is an actual thing. Antibiotics are good for infection, but when we clear out our healthy biome, we need something to replenish it. And uh, yeah, there's actually a treatment right now where we can do that with someone else's poop. 
Okay, it, it, it's not as disgusting as it sounds. The, this is feces, fecal matter, that has been specifically grown inside of a laboratory and then placed into a delivery mechanism so that it's just getting into your gut. It, it sounds strange, but, but hear me through. Open Biome is the first stool bank in the United States. Now, just like a blood bank or a seed bank, what they're doing is they're looking for and cataloging the different bacteria and microorganisms that live inside the human body so that they can then take cultures and develop those bacteria and turn it into specific targeted pills for people to replenish that healthy biome. Now, they take donor stool from healthy people and they prepare it for transplantation into sick humans. Now, last year, they found out that antibiotics had wiped out the microorganisms that kept the bacteria, and I'm going to mess this up, so anyone who has a science background, I do apologize, Clostridium difficile. Actually, if it was Italian, I'd say difficile. Now, that let it bloom, and it let them release toxins that cause persistent diarrhea. Imagine diarrhea, but it never stops. Ever. And that's exactly what the effect would be. Now, using a transplant of processed donor stool, they reestablished a normal community in the gut and they stopped the colony multiplication. Now, this year, they've perfected their treatment. Now, instead of a somewhat invasive procedure, which would require them putting tools in places that you would probably prefer they not put tools, patients can now take a $635 30-day course of pills to boost your healthy gut bacteria. And that's actually dropping. It sounds strange, I know, but the results bear it out. C. diff infects 450,000 people a year and it kills 15,000. So all being said, that's a relatively inexpensive treatment and uh, it's a big deal. In any case, that is some freaking science. Oh, I said we were going to be talking about poop, but I also said we were going to be talking about power, specifically diesel. Now, every once in a while, you're going to read a story about somebody who makes a device and they claim that their device extracts hydrogen from water and uses it to run a car engine, which they then use to drive an alternator that drives the hydrolysis that extracts more hydrogen, which drives the engine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, they're saying that their first grade science fair project is a perpetual motion machine. And yes, right now, flat out, anyone proposing a perpetual motion machine is proposing a scam. Either that or they're just proposing really, really bad science. You're going to always lose energy in trying to separate hydrogen from water, hydrogen and oxygen. So you need something else, some, some other principle, some other piece of technology, some other process that makes it a worthwhile process. Now, there is one, and believe it or not, it was developed by Audi. See, Audi created something that allowed them to create this blue crude, which is just a nice way of saying a liquid energy carrier, out of water, out of hydrogen that they separated from water. Now, power is generated from a renewable energy source. That could be solar, that could be solar thermal, it could be geothermal, it could be wind, hydro, whatever it might be. As long as you get it from a carbon neutral source, you are in line with the process. Now, that power is used very simply to split water into H2 and O2 via electrolysis. And electrolysis, again, that's a first-grade science fair thing. If you put an anode and a cathode into a jar of water and you cap the cathode and the anode with test tubes and you run current over it, you're going to get one test tube with hydrogen and one test tube with oxygen. It's really that simple. There's nothing in it. It's basic chemistry. Now, the O2 is vented, and then the H2 is passed into a high-pressure reactor with CO2, carbon dioxide. And there it undergoes a two-step process. The carbon dioxide becomes carbon monoxide. It releases one of its oxygen atoms. Now, the H2, which we liberated from the water, is then released into this, and it forms with the released oxygen atom H2O to become the waste product. The remaining part becomes blue crude. You have H2 and CO, then that's my liquid energy carrier. Now, the blue crude can be refined into different forms of usable fuel, the, and they're calling it e-diesel. Now, the, the resulting e-diesel burns with more efficiency, about 70%, and with better combustion characteristics, that's quieter and fewer pollutants, than anything else. That means no sulfur, no aromatics. It doesn't smell like burning fuel, and it can be used as a replacement fuel in today's diesel engines. Now, most importantly, it is a carbon neutral process. 
coupled again with that carbon neutral electricity generation, you have a carbon neutral energy carrier. At no point will you be adding more carbon into the environment. That's a pretty big deal. Now, we've covered this before when I talked about the solar jet. Now, this was back in my know-how days where they were using essentially a solar tower to create the high temperatures and the pressures required to do this. This is just something that can be done inside of a laboratory in a way that's a little less natural, but a bit more consistent. Now, folks, that's our poop and our power. Oh, Imagine putting those two together. Now, next up, I've got a little something something. I thought I'd bring you back to CES so that we could take a look at the tech. I'm Father Robert Ballister at Showstopper CES 2020, and I've got some tech for those who need a better night's sleep. I'm going to put you in a cocoon. One of the luxuries of tech is that it allows us to change the way that we live. One of the ways that I'm looking to change is how I sleep. Now, I'm standing with Tim Antos. He is the CEO of Cocoon Technologies. Tim, you've got something that you think is going to help people who are looking for not just a better night's sleep, but a better way of approaching sleep. Exactly. So it's a set of really comfortable headphones that are designed to help you listen to uh, audio via our app. So you can use them as regular headphones as well. Uh, but what makes them special and unique is they're very, very comfortable. So they're ergonomically shaped so you can side sleep, you can roll around. Um, and they also have sensors in, so they're measuring your EEG, which is your brain activity, your heart rate and heart rate variability. And from that, you can start to understand what things are actually helping you relax. So you can understand, OK, this type of audio is really effective at getting me to sleep. And then we'll suggest other things that are more like it. So we've taken some of the principles that you'd usually learn in a sleep clinic and packaged that up in such a way that anyone can engage with the content wherever you are, kind of however severe your problem is. So what we're really trying to do with our product is take a lot of really kind of well-proven, evidence-led science and just make it accessible to anyone, kind of however severe their issue is. You know, it could be just a fleeting issue, you know, a lot of people here traveling, jet lag, etc. Or it could be a real kind of chronic issue that you've been struggling with. And what we're trying to make it, um, we're trying to make sleep science much more accessible to anyone on their own terms. And, and that's what the, the Cocoon product's all about. I love a science-based approach because we all have sort of our, our pet projects for getting to sleep. We, yeah. we have the, the cup of tea that we like to take at a certain hour or the piece of music that, that puts us into a relaxed state or maybe there's an audio book. But when you have something like this that can actually track what's happening as you sleep, that, that has an app that lets you record what are the things that are most effective, what's the music that puts you most at ease, when is your brain most restful, then it's not just guessing, it's, it's actual science-based. Exactly. It's just really giving you the data to make more informed decisions. And we also use that data dynamically. So the audio as you fall asleep will automatically fade out. So if you're listening to an audio book, that audio book will, will fade out, pause, and then we'll bring in white noise. And white noise is actually very effective at masking out disturbances. Uh, much more effective than, say, just uh, active noise cancelling, which the product also has. But when you combine the two, you can really block out, you know, if you've got a really noisy, snoring partner next to you, it'll block that right out and, and really kind of cocoon you, as, as, as we say. This feels like it's been designed from the ground up to be something that you can cuddle with. It's almost like an audio pillow. Completely. And there's, there's a, quite a lot of it, different innovations. So the, the profile is designed to be very slim. Um, and the shape is probably the most critical element. So. The way that it's designed is that the pillow molds around the shape. So when it's on your ears, the pillow is really molding around here and putting pressure as much on your face as, as the, the headphone. With a conventional headphone, it'll all get kind of one focus point of pressure. But with this, the, the pillow can mold all the way around it. Um, and we have two different cushions inside. So in here, we have the acoustic seal for really blocking out the sound. And then here we have the comfort seal, and this is breathable and then you can kind of wash it so you'll see here um, it's kind of aerated holes where 
enables it to keep cool when you wear it for longer periods. Now, I know that these are about 349 I know that they're available either on your website or on Amazon.com. Yeah. But what I want to leave my audience with is, who is this for? Who, who is the person, the perfect user for a cocoon? Who's the person who's going to be able to actually take that data and turn it into a better night's sleep? Um, so um, it, it really varies. Um, so it's really a person that is looking to improve sleep in their life. So it could be um, a frequent traveler. It could be an insomniac that has a chronic problem. Or it could be just a more on and off. I've got the occasional issue. You know, I'm stressed for some reason or you know, that I've got kids and they're keeping me up or, you know, my snoring partner's just not letting me sleep. So what we've really focused on is how we kind of take that science of the sleep clinic out to anyone. Um, and, and it's really a product that you can use on your own terms because, you know, at the end of the day, you can use it as a regular set of high-end, kind of good quality headphones. Uh, but it's there when you need it um, to, to really help out as well. Tim, thank you very much for speaking with us. We're going to take a closer look at the Cocoon, both on All About Android and on the Digital Jesuit. Now, if people wanted to find out more, where should they go? Um, cocoon.io. So our website, K-O-K-O-O-N, is the cocoon.io. And on there, lots of detail, videos, all of the good stuff. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the Digital Jesuit. And you don't need to count sheep. Sometimes you just need a cocoon. There's, there's so much about this that I think they've done well, and yet it does fall short in a few very vital areas. Now, first of all, this is probably the most comfortable uh, set of headphones I've ever used for sleeping, specifically for sleeping, but... If you try to use them as like your standard headphones, there, there are so many things that are lacking. It doesn't quite seal around your head if you're not lying down. The, uh, the, the cushion does tend to get a little bit warm. It kind of retains heat, but, I, but those are relatively minor. The other issues that I had with this was the fact that the Bluetooth module on this, it, it has this little bit of a delay, which means that if you're using it for something like video editing, which I do all the time, you can't really use it because every time you stop, when you restart the uh, the audio playback, you're going to miss like the first quarter of a second. That sounds like not much, but if you're doing that professionally, if you're trying to edit video, you can't have your headphones constantly stopping and having you to back up so that you can hear the track. One of the other puzzling design cues was this. This is the analog audio port, which I like. I love the fact that they did that so that I can bypass the Bluetooth altogether, but this is how it looks. It kind of it sticks out of the back which, this is the strangest placement ever. I mean, I could understand down here. I could even understand here with, with a connector off the side, but kind of hanging down behind your head on a right angle, not, not a good look. The sound quality is pretty good. And again, it is crazy, crazy comfortable. But then there is the major drawback right now. And this is something that could be fixed, but I have to be honest. And that is that the service doesn't work well. When I first got this kit, I was amazed because the amount of data that it returned for, for like the first month was fantastic. It told me when I went to sleep. It told me when I was entering into restful sleep, when I was getting to a REM eye movement. So it was everything it promised to be. But then it got popular. After CES, there were, I guess, too many people who were really into this. I mean, there's there's so many of us who get bad night's sleep that this was technology that uh, that they wanted to try, even, even at that price point. What that meant was that the servers overloaded, and I stopped getting any analytics. I was always syncing with the servers. It wasn't actually uploading any data, and then I stopped getting any of the metrics back. Now, I talked to the folks over at Cocoon, and uh, they said, yeah, they, they were caught a little unaware. They didn't realize the product was going to be this this uh, popular so quickly. And so they were trying to ramp up and they were actually having to redesign their infrastructure so that it could handle a larger load. Now, I, I can't fault them on that. That's, a, that's actually a very common thing that you get with startups. But at the same time, it means that I can't review it properly. If I got good analytics and now I'm no longer getting it, I have to assume that people aren't going to get what they buy. They want to buy a device that can give them information about their sleep, information that is actionable, information that will let them know, hey, you know what, you you sleep better when you sleep at this time, or you sleep better when you're listening to, to these kinds of sounds, or you sleep better when the music starts to fade out 15 minutes before you hit deep sleep. 
These are things that I, I would love because they allow me to hack how I sleep. They allow me to hack my body. It's, it's a set of headphones, but really what it is, it's a sleep interface. Now, I, I will say this. Even with all the troubles and even with all the design things that should change, because this is level one, I hope the company stays around long enough to create a version two. I would love the ability to have the SDK. If they gave me the ability to sync this with my local computer, to do the analytics on my local computer. And yes, I understand that means they'd have to give me some of their special sauce because that's that's one of the things that makes the product so unique. It would be amazing. It would mean that there are makers out there who would take this and they would turn it into something that was completely unexpected. And for me, there is no better use of a technology and there really is no better praise than I can give a technology than it was able to do something that the makers never imagined. So Cocoon, if you're listening, I'm ready for you to improve it. I'm ready for a version two. And yes, I am ready for some sleep. Now, folks, I want to get you into the regular pattern of Padre's Corner. And the Padre's Corner is typically going to be a couple of stories up top. It's normally going to be some sort of pre-recorded segment, usually a, a tech review, maybe a, a live event here and there. But then I'm also going to do something a bit more in-depth. I like to jump in. I like to actually geek out, really, really geek out. Not just talk about the science, but to dive in there. And today I want to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, and that's the space program. Now, 50 years ago, the Apollo 13 mission was thrown into chaos by a failure of the oxygen tank in the service module. Now, a lot of us understand this. We've we've seen the stories, we've watched the movies, we've been uh, introduced to all the facts, but I want to take you to a geek's eye view of all of the events leading up to and after that accident. Now, that was just two days after launch. It was a day before they were scheduled to be the third crew to land on the moon. And yes, we do kind of know the facts, but you know, there's an entire generation out there that maybe doesn't have all the info that they need. There have been a lot of excellent accounts of the mission, from the documentaries created by NASA to amateur space enthusiasts to an incredibly well-done film in 1995 directed by Ron Howard and starring Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxton, Gary Sinise, and Ed Harris, among others. Now, what I want to do is to look at what they've called the successful failure in that the mission never reached the surface of the moon, but the ingenuity of the crew, NASA, the engineers, the staff, and the scientists let it come back to Earth. Uh, but I want to show you that something that should have been terrifying is, if you look at it with the geek's eye, actually quite inspiring. Now let's look at just the facts. Now Apollo 13 was the third Apollo mission that was supposed to land on the moon after Apollo 11, with a crew that consisted of mission commander Jim Lovell, command module pilot Jack Swaggart, and Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes. Now, each of them were highly trained military. Lovell was a naval aviator. He was a, te a test pilot who had already, already flown two Gemini and one Apollo mission. Swaggart was a, um, a pilot in the Air Force and in the Air National Guard before he also became a test pilot. And Fred Hayes was a Marine Corps pilot and a NASA research pilot. So they all had time in the seat. They all had command experience. They all had experience with test and research and experimental craft. So Apollo was really a natural fit. Now, had the mission been completed successfully, Lovell, Swaggart, and uh, and Hayes would have, uh, uh, sorry, Lovell, Lovell and Swaggart would have, dis no, Lovell and Hayes would have descended to the moon surface using the lunar uh, module, while Jack Swaggart would have stayed in the CM as the pilot. He would have stayed in orbit about the, the command with the command module waiting for them to lift off from the surface. Now let's talk a little bit about the Apollo missions because I'm just realizing that again, there's an entire generation of, of geeks that didn't obsessively pour over every technical detail like I did when I was a kid. Now when we talk about the Apollo spacecraft, it was actually three craft. First, there was the command module. Now, this is where the astronauts were seated at launch, and it was the only part of the spacecraft that would return to Earth. Now, then there was the SM, or the service module. Now, this contained the bulk of the equipment and needed to for the journey. It had the fuel cells, and those fuel cells combined oxygen and hydrogen to create electricity to run life support and all of the other equipment aboard the spacecraft. It was also the only power generation tools. You see, there are batteries aboard the command module and aboard the lunar module, but those can only store power. 
the fuel cells could actually generate power from the stored oxygen and hydrogen. So they were absolutely crucial for the mission. Without them, you'd run the batteries down and they would die. And shortly after, the crew would die. Now, though the service module didn't have any living space in it, uh, the other two spacecraft could not support life for very long without it. Uh, then there was the lunar module. Now, this is the craft that gets seen most often because it's so distinctive. It doesn't look like a craft. It looks like a bug. And that's because it was only designed to be used in space. It was only designed to be used for a very short amount of time. It did not re-enter the atmosphere. In fact, half of this thing would stay on the moon's surface. It was basically a can with a very thin skin designed to land on the moon, then launch two men back up into the moon's orbit. Uh, in just the upper half of the module right here is where you would have the ascent stage. This, this entire bottom part would actually stay on the surface of the moon. Now, you have to remember that when you're designing this, well, you have to think about weight. And that means you want to remove everything that you don't absolutely need. And so when they designed the lunar module, they said, well, if it's not going to operate inside of the Earth's atmosphere, if it doesn't have to survive re-entry, we don't have to give it shielding. We don't really have to give it that much life support. It's only got two of the crew, so we don't really have to pack it with enough power. In fact, the early version of the lunar module was actually going to have a fuel cell but then they did the calculations, and with some new battery technology, they said, we can actually save a little bit of weight by going with some fixed acid batteries rather than trying to use a fuel cell and a separate hydrogen and oxygen supply. Uh, now, that would come back to haunt them, but yeah. A fun fact, though the three spacecraft launched uh, uh, together, they needed to be docked in flight to make the trip to the moon. They couldn't launch like that. And that was because when you look at the spacecraft, well, it wasn't really designed to carry that kind of weight. Here, we've got the Saturn V booster. Actually, it's these three stages of the Saturn V booster. Then you've got the uh, lunar module. Then you've got the, the service module and the command module. And they were actually stacked like that on top of the rocket. The reason why they were stacked like that is because if you put them nose to nose, the lunar module would have to be upside down. It was not designed to, to handle that kind of stress. And if you connected them, you were exposing it to some vibrations. I mean, imagine this craft boosting you out into translunar orbit that would have torn the craft apart. As a result, the way that they did this was the three, the three components would separate well, actually two, because the command module and the service module stayed together. And then the command service module would flip around 180 degrees, dock with the lunar module, and then pull it out. Now, on top, I mean, on the top of this rocket, by the way, was, uh, was the crew. And below them was three stories or three segments of the most powerful rocket ever, ever created. Now, it, it was the Saturn V, which was classified as a super heavy lift launch vehicle. It was used by NASA between 1967 and I think 1973. It was, yeah, just a, a year before I was born. It was manufactured by Boeing, North American, and Douglas, and it could launch about 310,000 pounds to low Earth orbit or about 107,000 pounds to translunar injection. Now, by comparison, Falcon's, uh, uh, SpaceX's Falcon Heavy, their booster, can carry less than half of that, 140 thousand pounds to low earth orbit so we have never seen a vehicle like the saturn V. now by today's uh cost it, it would be impractical i think a launch would be upwards of a billion dollars per but still for for what it did there was no other vehicle that could have done the apollo missions it was kind of amazing all right let's get back to it now apollo 13 wasn't just a trip to the moon it was actually designed to carry out several very important experiments on its journey they would have drilled into the cone crater to look for evidence of an impact because they wanted to find out what was the history of meteor impacts on the surface of the moon. They were going to impact the ascent stage of the lunar module to test a nuclear-powered seismometer that had been left on the moon's surface by Apollo 12. They had an experiment called the heat flow experiment, would have, which would have measured the protons and electrons striking the moon from the sun. Now, all of those experiments were to be powered by an RTG, or a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which was an amazing device because it took, uh, it wasn't a reactor, it was a thermocouple. Basically, you had a pile of plutonium 
uh, P238, I believe, if, if memory serves, which would naturally decay. And as it naturally decayed, it would just generate heat. Now you have a thermocouple, which if you watch Know How, you know exactly how that works. If one side is hot and the other side can be cold, the heat will flow through the thermocouple and you will get electricity out. And in fact, the RTG on the Apollo missions, I think it generated about 100 watts, which wasn't a lot by today's standards, but back then, that was a, a ton of power. In, in any case, both Apollo 12 and Apollo 13 used the first two RTGs that were supposed to be left on the surface of the moon. By the way, the RTG from Apollo 13, because it actually returned with the uh, the guys, it splashed down harmlessly in the Pacific. So yeah, if you ever need an RTG, there's there's one there. Now let's get to it. Let's talk about the mission. Apollo 13 lifted off at 7.13 p.m. That's every, all the times will be in GMT on April 11th, 1970. Now, five and a half minutes later, the center engine on the Saturn V booster cut out more than two minutes earlier than it was supposed to. Now, it was, it was an easy fix. They just had to burn the remaining four engines longer, but it was, it was the first of a couple of glitches. Now, two and a half hours later, the spacecraft reached the velocity and the trajectory for a translunar injection, meaning that they were moving fast enough and in the right direction to escape Earth's gravity well and enter into the moon's gravity well. If you've ever watched Apollo 13, the, the movie with Tom Hanks, he, he has this presentation he's giving to the kids, and he basically says, look, you only have to get halfway there. Once you get halfway there, the moon's gravity will pull you the rest of the way. It's not actually half, but you understand the concept. Uh, at that point, even if the spacecraft were to lose all propulsion, it would end up somewhere near the moon. I mean, they wouldn't be able to do course corrections, but it would probably end up in orbit. Uh, 25 minutes after the translunar injection, the crew separated the command and service module. That's those two modules, the, the place where the, the astronauts were and the place where all their equipment was. They separated it and they turned it 180 degrees so that they could dock with the, uh, the lunar module. 42 minutes later, after they had docked and all the checklists had been completed, they injected the combined command service module and the lunar module from the Saturn V booster and then they burned the booster's engine to put it into a different trajectory than the CSM and the LM. In other words, they didn't want the booster <laughs> and, uh, and the spacecraft to be on the same trajectory in the same direction. They basically just separated them. Now, for more than two days, the mission was textbook. The crew made a few course corrections, totally normal. They stirred the cryotanks, totally normal. They took photos of Comet Bennett, Totally normal. They made a few TV bro broadcasts. Totally normal. There was one noteworthy glitch. On April 13 at 5.18 p.m., the quantity gauge on O2 tank number two read off-scale high. Now, that was most likely, we know now, the result of a short circuit, but they didn't know that. And since the glitch didn't affect the actual stirring of the tanks, the mission continued. They just assumed we've got a bad circuit, a bad sensor. It's still working. Let's go. On the 14th of April, at 3.06 a.m., Swecker started the process of stirring the oxygen tanks one more time. And for the next minutes, for the next minute, the O2 sensors on tank number two were erratic. They went high, then they went low, then it showed it full, then it showed it empty, then it showed it overpressure. But again, they'd experienced this before, they just thought the sensor must be bad. At 3.07 and 53 seconds, there is a sudden pitch, yaw, and roll. This is less than two minutes after he started stirring the tanks. All three axes of movement detected by the accelerometer. In other words, the craft is now spinning on all three axes. That's, a, that's an incredibly dangerous movement, no matter what kind of craft you're flying in. Now, at nearly the same time, O2 tank number two becomes unresponsive. O2 tank number one drops to 4.2 PSI. The fuel cell current shoots up by 2.8 amps. So all of this is happening at the same time. The crew is seeing warning lights and they're hearing buzzers and they're seeing readings that make no sense. You shouldn't have a sudden boost of current. An O2 tank can't suddenly just empty itself out. And the sensors show X, Y, and Z acceleration of 1.17 G, 0.65 G, and 0.6 G. Again, meaning that the spacecraft is now tumbling uncontrollably, and the thrusters keep firing, trying to correct the tumble. Oh, the master caution alarms start going off. O2 low, nitrogen low, power fluctuations, and it looks bad. Now, before we go on, I want to time travel. 
Let's go almost two years before Apollo 13 launched. Oxygen Tank 2 was being manufactured by the Beach Aircraft Company in Boulder, Colorado. Now, inside the tank were two thermostatic switches. Really simple. All they did is they made sure that the heater inside the tank could never get above 80 to 85 degrees. Super simple. And actually, I could make one of those right now. Now, these thermostatic sw switches were rated for 28 volts DC. And the reason why they were rated for 28 volts DC is because that's the voltage at which the command module was supposed to operate. So, of course, you would design it to operate with that 28 volts. I'll jump a year forward. That same tank is on a shelf that's designed to hold the O2 tank, and the shelf slips because of an improperly installed bolt. Now, no damage is detected, and the shelf is reinstalled in the service module for Apollo 13. But afterwards, they figured that the fall could have actually loosened the fitting on O2 tank number two. Now, jump another year forward, the rocket has actually been assembled. It's on the pad. In the countdown demonstration test that took place with the service module already mounted on the Saturn V, the cryo tanks are supposed to be filled, pressure tested, then emptied to show that they're ready for launch. The fill works perfectly, the pressure test works perfectly, but O2 tank number two will not drain properly. Now, since it's liquid O2, it's hazardous. They can't just go up there and dump it out, especially since it's already on top of the booster. Instead, they decide to turn on the heaters in the tank to boil off the O2. Now, this should be perfectly safe. They get the heater up to about 80 degrees, and all of that liquid will turn into gas and quickly escape from the tank. No problem. Unfortunately, the thermostatic switches, which are supposed to keep the temp from rising higher than 80 to 85 degrees, are unfortunately designed for that 28 volts. Again, designed for the 28 volts because that's what the command module is going to operate at. Of course, you're going to design it to operate with the command module. Unfortunately, after the tank was created, they changed the specs because they wanted to be able to use 65-volt technology on the gantry to do the test. It would allow them to do the test a bit more quickly with some different equipment. So they had changed the spec to make the sensors operate between 28 and 65 volts, but this tank had already been built. This is an incompetence, it's a miscommunication. Now, the sensors, again, were supposed to have been changed, but because it had already gone through quality control, they didn't. They didn't know that would even be a problem. Unfortunately, because the sensors were not designed for that temperature, they did not show the right level. They they were peaked out at 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what it was supposed to be. But unfortunately, since they were using 65 volts, they can now, after the event, figure out that the heater probably got up to about 1,000 degrees. Not 85, but 1,000 degrees. At 1,000 degrees, they actually start to degrade both the sensor and the uh, insulation on the sensor, as well as the insulation around the tank. It becomes more flammable. It becomes brittle. But again, they don't know this because it's already in the service module, already on the top of the rocket, already prepped for launch. Now, now let's fast forward to just the moment before chaos breaks out on board Apollo 13. So I could fil flips the switch to stir the tanks, and the damaged Teflon insulation can no longer hold back the current. There's just a small crack in the insulation, but it's enough to create an arc, and it's a powerful arc. That arc ignites the insulation around the tank. Now, if you've ever dealt with cryogenic fluid, you know what can happen here. It can immediately vaporize, which will boost the pressure inside the tank by several orders of magnitude. In just a moment, the fire overpressurizes tank number two, and it fails, filling that pressurized bay with O2 at a pressure high enough to blow out the exterior panel and expose the entire compartment to vacuum. Now, as the panel blows out, it strikes the high-gain antenna, which scrambles the communications with Earth for almost two seconds. And the escaping gas acts like a thruster. That's the reason why the ship is tumbling in all three axes. As it's rolling, that thruster, that constant thruster, the ex escaping gas is just pushing it in all the directions. And the loss of oxygen also means the fuel cells start to shut down. Let's jump back into present time. At 3.10 and 45 seconds, fuel cell 3 fails. At 3.22 and 7 seconds, just 11 minute, minutes later, fuel cell 1 fails. Less than two hours after that, at 5.13, fuel cell number 2 shuts down completely. 
at this point, there are no fuel cells working. The fuel cells were the devices that were supposed to power the entire air spacecraft. Without them, the only power that Apollo 13 has is, well, aboard the three modules. They have to shut everything down in the command module and then move to the lunar module. This is what we've seen in those movies, in all the historical documents. We see the crew using the lunar module as a spacecraft, as a, as a, as a lifeboat. Now, there is a wonderful thing that was put out by NASA. Uh, it came from the Lunar Observer. Uh, uh, lunar Observer. They recreated what the crew would have seen as they went around the moon. And it would have looked something like this. Now imagine, imagine being in the lunar module, a spacecraft built for two people. A spacecraft that wasn't really designed to act as a light bulb. And you see this. And you know that you were supposed to land there, but even orbiting at this, at this distance, it's a majestic sight. It's something that very few people have seen this close. You've trained your entire lives for this. This was supposed to be your moment of triumph. And instead, you're in a desperate fight for survival. The systems that are supposed to keep you alive are all dead. The command module is dead. It's been turned off. The service module is untrustable. You don't even know if the command module will be able to survive re-entry. For all you know, you could be a corpsicle for all eternity, floating between the Earth and the Moon, back and forth, back and forth, until your craft impacts with something. And yet you see this and you say, you know what? We're not going to die. We're going to make it home. We've got the entire brain power of NASA, really the entire brain power of the Earth. And we're going to get back. And at this point, this point in the, the journey, when they reestablish line of sight with the Earth, they're from, away from the dark side of the moon, they can reestablish contact with NASA and they're ready to do everything they need to do to get back. Now, they use the power from the lunar module to charge the batteries on the control module. Because remember, they've lost the fuel cells. So they no longer have the ability to generate the power. They only have the ability to use the power stored in the batteries. And the batteries in the command module were depleted because they needed time to shut everything down safely. Now, you're on board the command module, but you need to get the power from the lunar module through the umbilical. You're charging battery A, then you're charging battery B, and you're hoping, you're hoping that they'll last long enough for you to make it to splashdown. Because between the time that you cut loose the lunar module and you lose the ability to charge those batteries, and the time that you splash down, you need the computers to stay alive, you need to be able to make course corrections. You need them to automatically de deploy the chutes. You need them to warm the chutes. You need all of those systems to work exactly right. Otherwise, you're going to crash into the Pacific Ocean or burn up in the atmosphere. Now, at 5.53 p.m. on April 17, the craft enters the atmosphere. And it undergoes the longest comms blackout in the history of the Apollo program. And people wait. And they wonder, and they're not sure if the crew has made it. They're not sure if all of the hours of work, all of the, the patchwork, all of the MacGyvering that they've done to, to get them to this point has been worth it. They're, they're thinking maybe they're gone. Maybe they're dead. And then they hear a radio transmission. And at 6.07 p.m., Apollo 13 splashes down into the Pacific Ocean. Now, that's a geek's eye view. That's something that I've thought about for the longest time. I mean, yes, the drama is fun. I, I love what they did with the, the film with Tom Hanks. I think that was masterfully done, but I don't need extra drama. I don't need to see any interpersonal fights. The fact that you had a bunch of people who were able to throw away a mission and recreate a mission while the mission was ongoing that's inspiring to me. Yes, it's terrifying. Yes, it's, it's ridiculous to think about what those men underwent. All the emotions that must have flooded through them as they were thinking, there's no way we're going to get back to our loved ones. But at the same time, it's incredibly inspiring to me to think that, yes, you know, when, when we're pushed, we can do wonderful things. We can do things that we didn't think were possible. Just, just like when I, I was talking about when I was talking about the cocoon technology, I love when people make something that I've created do something I didn't know it could do. And that's exactly what we see in Apollo 13. In other words, 
That might be one of the reasons why I decided to become a maker. Well, folks, that does it for this episode of Padres Corner. I want to thank you very much for staying with me. It's been a lot of fun. You know I love to geek out. You know I love to talk about tech. And, uh, you know, anytime I I get to talk about science, I um, I love it. I'm a little tired right now. We, Of course, the Easter is kind of like the Super Bowl for us, even in quarantine. But it has been an absolute pleasure to spend time with you. Now, before you go, I want you to do me a favor. If you could please jump over to my YouTube page at youtube.com slash digital Jesuit. There, you'll be able to subscribe. Please subscribe. Pass this on to your friends. Ask them to subscribe. Not only are you going to be able to see Padres Corner, but you're going to see my reviews. And I'm actually going to start putting some of the older episodes of Padres Corner. I, I've had a couple of requests to uh, to show off some of the content I made, uh, content that I made way back in the day. Oh, and by the way, if you go there, you can see the very first content that I ever published to YouTube. That, that's a, episode one of Gadget. Uh, and back then, I was a tiny bit skinnier. Um, way, way more naive, and uh, I didn't have my content game down. But check it out. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a stroll down memory, memory lane. Again, please like the video. Please subscribe, and please pass it on to your friends. Also, don't forget to follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you follow me, you'll get to find out what I'm doing, what's up next, uh, what projects I've been working on, and uh, you get to see all the different sides of Padre. I'll talk about tech. I'll talk about politics. I'll talk about faith. I'll talk about religion. And I will engage with you. That is the best place to uh, to show me um, what you want to see on future episodes of Padres Corner. Also, let's do this. You may have noticed that my hair is a little messy, and that's because I've been in quarantine for almost two months now, and uh, I was supposed to have my hair cut right before quarantine started. So I'm going on two and a half months without a haircut. I'm trying to think of maybe I want to grow out a mullet or maybe just do the full-on ponytail. Send me photos on Twitter, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. Send me your photos of your quarantine cut, hashtag quarantine cut. And uh, <laughs> I want to see if your hair game is as messed up as mine. Finally, I, I do want to point out the fact that I have started up a Patreon. Now, I have not opened it. I have not start, started to accept any donations because I, I want to do this right. And right now is not the time for you to be donating to me. I'm fine the way I am. I'm not going to starve. I would like to eventually expand this so that I could expand my broadcast, expand my offerings, maybe prove to my superiors that this is something that can support itself here in the Vatican. But uh, let's hold off for now. I just want you to, to know about the Patreon. I want you to maybe bookmark it so that when I do activate it, you're going to be able to help me so that I can spread the word of Padre's Corner to... Uh, the far and wide to the generations that need to get it until next time i'm father robert balliser and as we did last uh last week i want to end with a song that is completely inappropriate for this show but holds a near and dear place in my heart take care god bless and i'll see you next time in the corner Oh, NSFW